Hey guys, you're watching Python tutorial videos on my YouTube channel, Python for Microscopists. In this video, I'm gonna talk about scaling, dropout, and batch normalization. Again, these are some of the uh, factors that can actually influence the training rate or even accuracy of your results. So let's start by looking at scaling. And here I'm talking about scaling of the features that are actually going into your uh, deep learning model as an input, okay? I'm not talking about batch normalization that's part of your deep learning, which we'll get to in a minute, okay? This is scaling, and some people refer to this as normalization, okay? And again, scaling is basically anything you can divide by, for example, uh, the maximum number to scale the numbers between zero to one, right? Normalization, technically, from a statistical point of view, uh, the term normalization means, of course, you scale it, but then you're actually bringing all the data into a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, which is also important uh, uh, for certain applications. Now, uh, typically, like I mentioned, uh, scaling refers to bringing all the uh, values to a uniform scale. And why is this important? Well, for most applications, it may not be necessary, but still doesn't hurt to do it. But let's say you're trying to do some sort of a regression problem where you have like one of the uh, inputs to be uh, age that goes between zero to 100, right? So let's say you're trying to do uh, the probability of someone trying to purchase a house, okay? And that depends upon, you know, a bunch of factors along with uh, their age and also, of course, the housing price. If the house is 1 million, then maybe certain age group may not be able to afford uh, that, type of, uh, uh, that type of prices. So in one column, or one of the uh, features would be age, the other one is uh, housing price. So age is only zero to 100, but housing prices can be 100,000 to a million dollars. So, but if you scale it, if you divide age by 100, then your values lie between zero to one, same with your housing prices, you can force them to be between zero to one, right? So this is what scaling is referring to, and it can affect your results uh, a lot. For example, for regression problems, it may have an effect, and in sometimes it may throw some cryptic error. You don't even know why that's happening, but the real issue is, hey, your values are not scaled. Um, so in some cases, it may have minimal effect, like convolutional neural networks, for example, if you have like uh, images that look very similar, you may not see much of a difference, okay? Uh, and uh, this is a quote of, out of one of the papers I was reading. Basically, it says, having features on similar scale can help the gradient descent because you are uh, basically relying on one way or the other, you know, the optimization process, right? Uh, so apparently if you have uh, all the inputs scaled, then the gradient descent converges more quickly towards the minima. So uh, quicker answer, not as much computation time. Now, here is an example that I tried, uh, malaria data set. Again, uh, just Google search for malaria data set deep learning, you'll find this. Uh, these are infected with malaria, these are not infected, right? These are parasitized and these are not parasitized or uninfected. Now you can see all the images, they have the similar histograms, similar structures and everything, not much different. So in this example, I did realize that scaling didn't make much of that much of a difference, okay? And again, scaling can be as simple as just dividing by 255 because these are uh, uh, images, 8-bit images, and for 8-bit images, your pixel value go uh, it goes from 0 to 255. So by dividing by 255, you're forcing the values between 0 to 1. Now, sometimes, like TensorFlow actually uses minus 1 to 1. So obviously, the way to do that is your pixel value minus 127.5 over 127.5. So this forces all the pixels to be between minus 1 and 1. It doesn't matter. Either way, you should be fine. The point is to bring everything to the right scale, okay? To a common scale. Now, that's scaling. It, it, it is in a way optional for the most uh, uh, cases, but I definitely recommend scaling without thinking because it's not going to hurt. At least I'm not aware of it, scaling hurting any of the uh, output, uh, you know, any of your results. Now, batch normalization is something that you actually add as part of one of your, uh, uh, you know, as part of your topology for your uh, deep learning when you define your model. This is where something that you can add. Now, if you want one takeaway of why you need to do batch normalization, it improves the speed, performance, and stability of your training. Now, uh, for example, and I'll give you a quick reason, okay? Let's say you have uh, a model that you are training a whole bunch on a whole bunch of red apples, but now you're trying to apply that on a green apple, it may not work out. 
okay, it will not uh, perform very well. That's because the shift in the input distribution, right? So for the red apples, the input distribution is uh, one way, and for the green apple, the input distribution is shifting towards the green side of the curve, right? So this is referred to as, I believe uh, there is a name for this, this is known as covariate shift, and apparently batch normalization uh, you know, uh, uh, really helps with this uh, covariate shift, okay? Now, uh, I mean, you can read the text uh, here, but the co whole point is batch normalization reduces the covariate shift, which means your uh, training is going to be a bit more uh, stable. And why is it called batch normalization? Because it's going uh, during the training process, so it's actually applying it or working on a single batch of images that is actually going into your uh, uh, training process. Okay, so uh, just to summarize the benefits, fast overall training of the network. Well, when you add batch normalization, it's gonna do extra computation. So for individual epoch may take a longer time, but then it takes fewer epochs to get to the answer. So you don't have to do 1000, let's say, you may get, a, uh, uh, you may get convergence even with 500 epochs. Enables higher learning rates, so that also speeds up and weight initializations become e easier. This is a big topic all by itself. Uh, again, there are people uh, doing research in terms of how, uh, what is the best way to initialize the weights initially, because again, as the epochs go along, the weights get updated, but if your initial weights are close enough, then the problem converges, uh, converges pretty fast, right? So there, it's a different size science altogether. Okay, for example, when you define your model, sometimes you, we initialize weights by using he underscore Uniform. I'll show you in a second. Okay, uh, I have a few lines of code, uh, and uh, makes it easy to work with many activation functions. Again, uh, when you do batch normalization, uh, again different activation functions. Sigmoid has uh, a range of zero to one in Y, for example. ReLU can actually go up almost to infinity, uh, and you don't have to worry about it. So by nar uh, normalizing batch normalization, you can switch between these activation functions depending on your application and. Uh, it makes it a bit uh, easier, okay? And overall, uh, the better results in most cases. So uh, uh, again, uh, one question that uh, I know it comes to your mind probably is, if you're doing batch normalization, do you need to scale your input data? That's a very valid question. In fact, for most convolutions, in fact, uh, uh, one of my, if I look at my earlier pieces of code, I haven't done scaling initially, but then scaling definitely helps. I still think you should do that because the first layer, before you even do normalization, obviously you apply normalization after the convolution, right? Uh, so the first layer, it's very important to have data set that's not, uh, scaled and uh, pre uh, preferably having a zero mean. If you wanna read more about it, here again, pause the screen and then I'll try to include this as part of my uh, as part of my description of this video, but this is a great uh, resource for reading, uh, reading more about batch normalization and, uh, uh, and other aspects, uh, including dropout. Now, a dropout, it can again have a huge effect or no effect. Again, it, uh, it completely depends on your architecture and the type of application. So the main purpose of dropout is to minimize overfitting. What is overfitting? Well, it works great on your test da uh, training data, but it fails on any other data. Okay, that's overfitting. So how does it help? Well, in an ideal world, if we have like a million computers uh, working on the same image, then you can have million different architectures and then uh, and then uh, uh, you take the mean of it, okay? But neural networks trained on a small data set can overfit the training data. When I say small, don't think of 100 or 500. It can be 100 depending on the application. It can be 1,000, uh, 10,000. Again, it depends on the application. But if you work on finite data set, you run into the problem of overfitting typically. So like I said, ideally to minimize this, you have a large number of different architectures and you look at the results and you take the mean. But that's not practical. You have only one computer that to a sucky computer that's probably not even good. So how do we get maximum out of it, okay? So you uh, drop out approximates this training of large number of neural networks by dropping out. As the name suggests, it actually drops out part of the data. Okay, so during training, some number of layer outputs are randomly ignored or dropped out. And I'll visually show you what that means in a second. And dropout is implemented per layer in your network. So if you define a convolutional layer, you can add dropout and then uh, another layer dropout and so on. And uh, 
Of course, it uh, roughly doubles the number of iterations required to converge, but overall the training time for a number of epochs is less. And by dropout, I mean, if you look at uh, the left-hand side, you see every node of this neural net is connected to every other node here, right? But during dropout, you can basically say, hey, drop out 20% of these, so it drops off that. So every time it's randomly dropping 20%, so your network architecture looks slightly different for each epoch. So this is how it simulates uh, having different architectures. So I have some results here, but before that, I'll just show you a few lines of code. I'm not gonna run this because this one takes uh, a while and I cannot show you every scenario. Anyway, I'll share this code anyhow on my GitHub. But what I'm gonna show you here is a, a few lines. So when I mean batch normalization and dropout, this is exactly what we are talking about, okay? So here uh, we are doing co convolutional uh, 2D. First of all, am I doing any uh, uh, normalization? If you see up here, this is my X train and Y train. I'm actually working on uh, CI FAR10, CFAR10 data set. This is, uh, uh, it ha it's CFAR10 because it has, uh, it has uh, 10 different labels all the way from airplane, automobile and all. And there are 60,000 images each 32 by 32 pixels. Okay, and these are 10 classes. That's the data set. And uh, here, as you can see, I'm normalizing the data set by using the, the uh, where is it, uh, normalize from keras.utils, okay? And you can do it many ways, okay? This is just one way of normalizing. You can actually scale it. Just divide uh, the values here by 255 and you're all set, okay? Uh, and you can try that. I'll let, uh, I'll let you discover the effect of uh, normalize versus scaling, okay? But then the point is here, all my values are converted to, uh, you know, floating point between zero to one. And then, so that's my scaling. And here I add batch normalization. So what I did is I actually commented my batch normalization out and then did, you know, ran this and then uh, included batch normalization. Same thing with my dropout uh, and dropout 0 0.2 means 20% of dropout. So 80% going through. Okay, so this is what I've done and I've done like 500 epochs and uh, now let's get back to have a quick look at the results again. You can do this on your own data sets to find out. Here, uh, I haven't done any scaling or non batch normalization and I'm not including dropout because dropout did not show much of an effect. So I, I don't have uh, any slides on that. You try it on your uh, own data. You see how crappy this is. The training loss is all over the place and the training accuracy is also jumping all over the place. And my validation accuracy is like at 0%. Uh, it's like nothing is happening. So in this example, the, I, I mean, I got to do something. The values are all over the place. So uh, I've added scaling, but no batch normalization, meaning I did my initial scaling to values between zero to one, but I haven't added batch normalization to each layer. So here, well, I see some hope, right? I mean, uh, the loss is uh, doing something, but then my validation accuracy is still not good. Training accuracy is also jumping all over the place. Now I added batch normalization, but no scaling. Okay, I'm not scaling here and only batch normalization, meaning my input values uh, initially ranging from zero to 255, and uh, then the batch normalization kicks in. Now we are talking about something, right? I mean, now you can see my training loss is better. My validation loss is doing something. Overall, it's trending in the downward direction, which is a good sign. Same thing with the accuracy. Now I do both and you can see how the model looks like. Okay, I'm scaling the input and also doing batch normalization. By the way, if I go back one slide to this one, if I actually ran this for another 30 or 40 epochs, you would have seen things getting much better, but then that would be much longer, right? So that's the importance of this input scaling. If it's not, if all the inputs are not normalized or scaled, then it may take a lot more iterations, epochs to actually get to the answer. And here you can see right away, even with 10 or 15 epochs, we started to get uh, uh, a flattened curve right there. So with an accuracy of 60%. Okay, I should probably change my network architecture to get much better, uh, much better accuracy, or uh, maybe increase the amount of, uh, let's say, uh, training data. But that's a different discussion. But you can see how nicely these uh, these uh, graphs actually look over there. So I hope you learned something about uh, you know these these inner workings of deep learning. And again, in the next tutorial, let's cover a different topic. As usual, I request you to subscribe to my channel because it keeps me encouraged to create more content for you guys. So thank you very much.